Look, thanks for, thank you for coming. Thank you very much to Hamish for hijacking me. <laughs> no, I kind of feel, I mean, I came to the workshop last Friday organized by uh, Sophia, Masha, Hamish, and Andres. Um, and that was lovely. It was terrific to be back in Edinburgh University for the first time, really, in I don't know how many years. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, Hamish wrote to me and said, would I do an additional talk? And my first reaction was, was well, that's exciting, but no, because it means work and that means preparing for it and thinking. And in the end, what I decided then was, yes, that I would love to do it, but I didn't want to prepare a public lecture as I would, I suppose I would usually do. I thought, well, no, I would actually love to just come and talk about what I'm working on at the moment and what's worrying me at the moment. So that's why it's not, it, yeah, well, that explains a lot, I think, of what, I'm, what I'll say. The other thing I wanted to say before starting is that basically I'm a very nice person, but just occasionally I think if I'm going to give a talk, there's no point in talking unless I annoy somebody. <laughs> no, unless. So this talk is really, I'm trying to annoy as many people as possible. Um, and that's why as we go through, we'll see that I kind of spell out the people I'm disagreeing with along the way. And really the whole thing arises from a book that I'm trying to write and finding difficult to write. The book is about hope, possibly called Hope and Hopeless Times. And I'm finding it difficult to think that through, um, I suppose because of the, the yeah, because of the world we're living in, frankly. Um, and not just a hope, it's not, oh, let's hope, a kind of a bouncy, bouncy song of, you know, let's hope. It's really an attempt to, to think hope um, and to say we have to learn hope and that means to learn to think hope. And in that, um, I suppose I'm following and paying homage to a book that really started me off in everything of all this, which was Ernst Bloch's Principle of Hope. Um, and what he argues in that book, I mean, he comes back from, as a, Ger as a German Jew, he comes back from exile to Germany after the war and publishes the three volumes of The Principle of Hope, which had a huge impact. And um, he starts off by saying, you know, now, after all we've experienced, after so much fear in the world, we need to learn hope. And that's really, I suppose I feel exactly that now is a time of growing fear, of fear, fear of what may happen, fear of the way that the, the world is going, fear of others, you know, the whole nationalism, racism thing is basically a fear of other people. And that's why I want to say now is the time to learn hope. Now, more than ever, is the time to learn hope. 
now is the ter time to learn hope because we can't just go back to Bloch. Bloch's, beautiful, Bloch's book is absolutely beautiful. It's a, a kind of really a hymn or a, a study of hope and the presence of hope, the presence of that which is not yet in all the different spheres of human life. You know, um, from fairy tales to architecture to dance to, um, to theater to religion to political theory. And I think um, that now <coughs> we can't just repeat that. He was thinking of hope against the background of the communist parties. He returned to East Germany initially, not to West Germany. He had confidence in the idea that the communist parties um, would be able to really bring about a radical transformation of society, a realization of hundreds of years of hope. And I think we just don't have that anymore. The communist parties are, on the ho are gone. The Soviet Union and the Chinese revolutions led really to societies that I think most of us would not want to live in, have lived in, um, and were in a very different situation. And my fear, fear, I suppose, what I worry about is that we are living in a time of disillusionment, that we have lost that capacity to hope, um, and that that not only, it's not only a personal thing, it's also an epistemological Thing. It's a question of how we think. It's a question of what we understand knowledge to be, what we understand theory to be. So if we think of Marx or if we think of critical theory, really the whole structure of thought is based on the transitory or potentially transitory character of capitalist society. I mean, that, that's really the basis of, 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 of Marxist, of that whole tradition of thought. If we say, well, no, that's not on anymore. Pff, that's really 20th century stuff. Um, then we're saying that form of thinking no longer has any validity. Um, and I suppose our minds, I feel that Part of my fear is that our minds then become narrower. We're no longer able to think from a society that does not yet exist. Because that idea of the society that does not yet exist um, just loses all meaning. Uh, or to put it more simply, um, my friend Eileen, who's not here, I think, at the moment, she was saying a couple of days ago, she was telling us about her father, um, what, in the 60s, 70s, I suppose. He, and she said he had a really firm, naive hope in the possibility of a different world. But kind of talking about it in the past, and I suppose what I want to do, or what I want to do with the book, is to say we mustn't lose that. We mustn't lose that naive, if you like, hope in the possibility of a different world. And part of the reason that we mustn't lose that is that if we do lose it, then very probably we are hastening on the train that is taking us to our possible extinction. That is really important to come back to that hope. It is really important to think through that hope. 
So the book is really about how we can, how then, how do we think hope? Um, and just before Hamish wrote to me, I came to the conclusion that, ah, that the key to thinking hope is the concept of capital. And it's really then I thought, well, what do I mean by that? You know, very often I read articles or theses or books and I think, yeah, terrific, but they've no concept of capital. Yeah. And I leave it there. And then if I ask myself, well, what do I mean or how can I explain what I mean by a concept of capital or why that seems to me of fundamental importance, um, then that's really what I'm trying to do today. Okay, um, and so I broke it up into, well, or I tried to work it out in the form of an 11 theses, um, which you have there. And you have them partly because I say it's not a kind of well worked out public lecture. It is actually trying, me trying to work through these points. Um, and in some ways, yeah, in some ways they may seem fairly ac ac abstract, but, but for me they are important. And the first point, okay, so then I start off just asking, well, what do I mean by a concept of capital? And I think the first thing I mean is that the existing that the existing pattern of social relations is not just a kind of haphazard conglomerate. It actually has a unifying pattern so that we can talk about some sort of unifying social p pattern of relations, of relations between people. And that's what I understand by capital. It's a way of trying to understand the pattern of relations that prevail in existing societies. And the important thing about these, well, one important thing about this pattern of social relations is that it has a dynamic built into it. And this dynamic is, seems, I mean, there are lots of indications at the moment that this dynamic of social relations not only destroys lives, not only kills people, not only excludes people, for example, from medical treatment, not only destroys traditional communities, not only shapes what is meant by education, for example, but that it is also taking us closer and closer towards disaster and very possibly extinction. So to talk of capital is to say we are in an urgent situation. Essentially, we are sitting on a train that is taking us towards extinction. And the problem, the problem posed by Benjamin is how do we pull the emergency brake? This idea, of course, that the structure of social relations has a dynamic built into it, a dynamic really determined by the pursuit of profit, a dynamic that Marx refers to with the lovely phrase, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. This idea that the social relations, the structure of social relations has a dynamic built into it obviously is central to the whole history of Marxism. But what we often call orthodox, what we often call orthodox Marxism, that is the Marxism essentially of the communist parties and of the Soviet Union, 
perhaps of Engels, of Marx in his bad moments, that sort saw this train heading towards a light at the end of the tunnel. The idea was that, okay, we're on the train, we don't really have control over it, but at the end of the day, it will lead us to a communist society. In other words, it was the idea that history is on our side. And it's really Benjamin and I suppose also the Frankfurt School. Um, but I think more and more people, more and more Marxists, more and more people in general um, would say, no, the train isn't taking us towards some sort of happy ending. The train seems to be leading us towards a total disaster. No? That's the idea, for example, in Adorno's negative dialectics, where he says, well, after Auschwitz, it is grotesque to have an idea of the dialectics ending in a ha with a happy ending. It's not like that. We can think of dialectical movement as a negative movement, but everything suggests that this negative movement is leading us towards disaster. So the question is not how do we fulfill history, but how do we break the dynamic of history? And how, that's really the question. We don't know anymore. I think 30 years ago, probably 40 years ago, we had a clear idea of what revolution meant, how to break capitalism. I don't think we have that anymore. Um, we have certainly the idea, or I suppose hope very often we just attach to uh, you know, the next election. We hope that Jeremy Corbyn will win. We hope that Boris Johnson won't become prime minister. We hope that Trump will lose. We hope that... You know, and we hope that they will bring about major changes. And yeah, okay, they can bring about small changes, perhaps, but they really, governments, do not control the situation. No, there is, I suppose, in this idea of capital, it's the idea that there is a darker, stronger um, structural force which really goes far beyond what any government can do. Which also means, of course, that the issue is not neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, I suppose, is one of the words I dislike strongly because neoliberalism suggests that the way that the world is going can just be understood in terms of policy choices or economic theories. And I don't think that's right. I think that the problem is not neoliberalism, the problem is capitalism. Okay, so that's the first point. If you want, if you want to interrupt me at any point, just do, or you can just heckle, or <laughs> applaud, or whatever. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Um, the second point, I suppose, is, okay, we're on the train headed towards disaster. I think that's inherent in the notion of the concept of capital. You know, that means, yes, we are really in an urgent situation. I mean, groups like Extinction Rebellion have been saying that very clearly. Lots and lots of groups talking about climate change and um, destruction of biodiversity and all sorts of things have been saying very clearly we're heading towards disaster. The question then is how do we break that dynamic? Is there any way we can break that dynamic? 
And the second point I make this really is that this dynamic, if we understood capit understand capital as being that dynamic, it's not simply, or it is not, an automatic logic. Okay, there are those uh, approaches known as capital logic approaches or approaches associated with the new reading of Marx, um, where they really see the, this capitalist development as the unfolding of a logic. Um, I think it's not quite that, it is rather an unrelenting process of attack. And that this is very important, that capital isn't just an unfair system. And we all know how obscene it is, how obscene social inequalities are. But it's not just that. It is actually a, proce a process of attack, a process that capital, in other words, is a process of capitalizing society. And probably we're all aware of that too, of the way in which capital, or sometimes simply in the form of money, has been penetrating our lives more and more profoundly, especially and very clearly over the last 20, 30 years. No? I mean, there has been a, a capitalization uh, our monetization of education in the form of privatization, private universities, privatization, private schools, etc. There has been a capitalization of healthcare, again in the sense of privatization, in terms of um, neglect for the, for, the, for the NHS. There has been a capitalization of of the lives, for example, of millions and millions and millions of peasants who maybe 30 years ago could live more or less self-sufficient lives, poor lives usually, on their own land and are now living, have been pushed or moved into the, the big cities of the world where they usually live in slums. Okay, so we can look around, we can see capital, not as a thing, but as this, this process of capitalizing, as monetizing. And this movement of capitalizing can also be seen as a process of <coughs> totalizing, a process by which capital comes to shape all aspects of social relations more and more. I think we're very conscious of that very often within universities, the way in which um, the profit mo motive or the pressures of generating profit in the, in the end of the day have come to infiltrate, to permeate more and more the meaning of education. If we think of it as a process of totalizing, then we are thinking, I think, of, I think this is what has been happening in the last 20, 30 years, is that then there are two ways, well, basically there are two ways of thinking about revolution. One is to replace one totality with a different totality which was, I think, the old concept of revolution. No? We seize power, we get rid of capitalism, we create um, a system of socialist planning. No? Or I think what has been growing more and more is the idea, no, if we see capitalism as a totality of social relations or a totalizing of social relations, then our struggles against capital are about detotalizing. They're about breaking this totalizing force, about creating spaces of autonomy, about finding ways in which we say, no, we will not subject what we do in this lecture room, let's say, to the requirements of capital. 
Okay. This, if we're looking for Marxist theorists to annoy, this is a, it would be a critique of Lukács, for example, who starts off, you know, what is orthodox Marxism by saying orthodox Marxism is at the point to adopt the point of view of totality. And I think he's right if you mean that as a critical concept. You know, we criticize the totality, but not if you mean it as in the sense of we want to replace one totality with another. So hence the concept, I think, of, of revolution as a detotalizing process, or as the Zapatistas put it, what we want is to create a world of many worlds. Okay, so you've got capital then as a totalizing attack, a movement of capitalization of social relations. And of course, then there are constant resistances. I mean, in a way, we're probably all here because we have some sort of relation to or want to have some sort of relation to these movements of resistance. And it seems to me that these, these resistances are obviously enormously important. They affect the course of, so, of social development, but they have not yet succeeded in breaking the basic dynamic of capital, which is the push towards um, the pursuit of profit. So that we can say, for example, if we follow Negri, that the Russian Revolution led to the Keynesian welfare state. In other words, it was because of the fear generated by the, the, the Russian Revolution that there was a rethinking of the meaning of capitalism by economists, by um, politicians, etc. And this led them to the proposal of the beverage plan and all that followed in terms of a rethinking of the basis of, of the way in which capitalism should be organized. But it did nothing to um, stop the basic dynamic, which is the pursuit of profit, which of course has um, after, I mean, after a number of years, started to break up this Keynesian welfare statism in throughout the world. And then the third, the last thing I point to, put in that point is simply that then these resistances, it seems to me to understand, it's important to understand them as not being external to the movement of capital, but as being negative, antagonistic, and the movements related negatively to capital. This is an issue, for example, in autonomous thought. It's an issue, it seems to me, in the current literature about commons, the commons, that there is a, a tendency to think of the commons or to present the commons as a positive force um, rather than seeing it as being in negative tension with the development of capitalism. You know? And since I'm really trying to annoy anybody, that's also a critique of, of whom? I suppose the post operaistas of Massimo de Angelis and possibly of Silvia Federici, whom you should all definitely try and go and listen to this week. It's the second point. The third point I suppose which really takes I suppose me into the heart of my worries is 
there is the question of, to talk about the concept of capital as being central, is really to say what I want to say is that there is one enemy. And I think that notion is really fading a bit from current discussions. The Zapatistas express it very nicely, the whole question of the unity and diversity of the enemy, I suppose, or of oppression, and the whole question of disillusion, disappointment. When they say capital is a hydra, no? capital is like the monster in Greek mythology that Hercules had to defeat. And the characteristic of the hydra, of course, is that once you cut off one head, three heads grow in its place. It is a monster with, what, six, nine heads to start off with. You cut off its head and three more heads grow in its place. And I think we often get that impression with capitalism in a way that's why very often we think, well, what's the point? No. Um, the Russian Revolution seemed to chop off its head. The Chinese Revolution seemed to chi chop off its head. And here we are, a hundred years later, after the Russian Revolution, and capital is more powerful than ever. It seems to have more heads than ever. So how on earth do we... How on earth do we kill it? No. It's the idea that capitalism is a system with many different presentations and that it is invincible until we succeed in going to its heart. But it doesn't seem to have a heart. It seems that there are so many different forms of oppression. But um, we think how? I mean, the most obvious, the most common formulation, really, that you see all the time is really, yes, I mean, it's capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism which is the idea of a three-headed monster, and I want somehow to say, no, I want a one-headed, <laughs> no, I want a, a multi-headed monster, but I want it to have one heart, so that we can actually think of hope in a way that points through to the other side and doesn't just reproduce different forms of oppression. And that leads me, I suppose, to another thing, since I'm hitting out all around me, is the concept of social movements. The concept of social movements, which has become now so universal, and is so attractive because, because if you're on the left and you want to do something interesting in sociology or anthropology or whatever, you go and study social movements. No. Um, and lots, you know, you go and study all sorts of social movements, um, movements of resistance, movements against the privatization of water, movements against the opening of mines that will destroy communities, movements of the Dalits in India, I suppose, movements of all sorts of movements. You can even you can think of the Zapatistas as a social movement if you really want to be violent. No? Um, and the, the point about the social movement is that, it seems to me, it is not at all an innocent term. Uh, the idea of the social movement 
suggests that we've got basically a more or less stable society, but the, these movements <coughs> spring up all over the place. The, as far as I know, the social movements was developed, the idea of social movements was developed more or less consciously in the when 70s, 80s, to replace the notion of class struggle. And you can say, well, the notion of class struggle had its problems, yes. But at least the idea of class struggle pointed towards an enemy. The idea of social movements points towards an infinite number of enemies. And if you've got an infinite number of enemies, then obviously the idea of hope is absurd. Because yes, we hope we'll win this struggle and that struggle and the other struggle. But the idea of some sort of coherent structure in the, in the social relations of this world gets lost altogether, I think, with the, with the idea of social movements. Um, the Zapatistas, again, I keep on quoting the Zapatistas because they say lovely things. Um, but they talk about, not about social movements, but about movements of resistance and rebellion. And I think if you think of most social movements, they actually can be characterized fairly easy, easily as movements of resistance, and in some cases as movements of resistance and rebellion. In other words, they are a result of an attack. They, aren't, they don't just come out of nothing. They generally are the result of some sort of aggression against the existing social relations. Um, yes, Sorry, thanks, Sen. Couldn't you reverse the causality there? Because it seems to me that, um, that at one level you could just say, well, the reason we had the social movements or they were taken up so much is precisely because the failure of the, 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 the group, the section that was destined to perform a world historical law quotes. I mean, if, as Jerry Cohen said, so if, if, if the working class fulf doesn't fulfill its historical role, I'm talking in scare quotes, then you start looking for others. And the history of the left moves from the working class to um, blacks, to homosexuals, to this, to that, to intersectionality, and on and on and on, precisely. And, and the cause of that is, is it's the other way around. It's the lack of hope that causes the failure. Um, at the beginning rather than anything else. You don't keep fighting on, you look for other things. Ah, yes, I think you do look for other things. I'm not, um, I think, I mean, I think that's my worry. No, I mean, it's not that these are nasty inventions. No, I mean, social movements is a way of trying to talk about real changes that take place, especially from the 70s, 80s onwards, no? that the organized working class no longer is playing the same role in social struggles that you get, as you say, um, all the examples you mentioned. What worries me is, not, is that in the process, the concept, the idea, the concept of capital gets lost, or the concept of a unifying social structure with its dynamic. That, that's what worries me. I mean, that's not saying, oh, we shouldn't do that sort of study, but I think that it's very important how we think about it, how we conceptualize it, because I think there is a process, um, there is a kind of change in the language <coughs> which is gradually reducing our ab ability to think in terms of a radical break with capital. <coughs> no? You can say, well, we learned in the <coughs> 70s that that, wasn't or in, that that wasn't possible. Fine. But if that's not possible, then we are actually trapped in the train <coughs> of, of capital. I mean, which is a r it's not a, an unreasonable conclusion. I just think it's a terribly dangerous conclusion. Sorry, Sophia, were you going to? No. Oh. Um, well, I was thinking that it's interesting to think of that, 
how that term social media came about, because um, <coughs> at your saying it was to do with um, repudiation of class struggle made me think of it in a different way. In that earlier thinkers had rather thought of the crowd, any kind <coughs> of crowd, any sort of organized force outside the elite and the state as dangerous. Um, so the collective behavior schools tended to have that orientation, to think of the crowd as dangerous. And the um, scholars who came <coughs> up with the idea of social movements were trying to create a positive Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely it. I think that there's this space for social repair. Um, yeah, as I'm not sure if it's. I don't really know enough. I was told that um, certainly Alain Touraine had a a major role in promoting the notion of social movements and he was doing it quite consciously as um, an anti anti marxist or anti that doesn't really matter but it, what is important i think is exactly what you say i mean it's the opening up it's the kind of suggestion that all these um, conflicts are open to social repair, to a process of reconciliation within the existing system. No? So that people may go on talking about, on, so that the, con the idea of systemic struggle, I think, gradually kind of falls off the desk, as it were. Uh, that's but then the dictatorship of the proletariat is precisely that, is what you say. It's um, it's because as soon as you say that, you're already um, you're 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 already given up because you're already um, you using categories which are those categories of the of the present sort of society. So all we do is cha change. So it's not the kind of, I mean, in that sense. There's a kind of slippage in what you're saying between um, between the problem of, of, of capital and the struggle between those two things and the working class, because the working class always becomes the organised working class very quickly. And as soon as it becomes that, it becomes yet another social movement, but controlled. And therefore, in a sense, it's no longer... It's no longer... Um, it, it, it will make exactly the same... It makes the same mistakes as all the other social movements you were talking about because it doesn't recognize that its kingdom is not of this world, to quote some other revolutionary. I think you could say, and I would say, that there's a positivization of the concept of the working class that does impose itself long before the concept of social movements. Yes, yeah, that's right. And that that leads to disaster as well. I mean, but. But I suppose I'm saying, fine, that's right, but social movements aren't the answer. No, 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 and no. we tend to take them too easily without questioning. That's really, um, you know. And the other thing, I suppose, yes, which you mentioned, of course, is the idea of intersectionality, which as well suggests um, that there are at least three or a number of different heads or different struggles that should come together, but that are distinct. I mean, that's... Um, John, can I say yeah. something oh. about, about that? Uh, I think Marx consciously uses a different term to work class. He, he chooses the term proletariat uh, because he realises that working class is inadequate. And 
I think if we think of it in terms of dialectic and negativity, the proletariat are those who are forced to oppose and transcend capital. I think that's the way it's helpful to think about. It. That's what it is, and that that that's totalizing in a sense. But it 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 has a dynamic to it, and it and it also allows everybody to feel well. Yeah, I'm, I am part of that. I, I need to resist capital and go beyond it, so I can be part of that, as opposed to uh, what can be quite divisive forms of thinking about struggle. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree very much, actually. In, in Puebla, we, I suppose we tend to talk about the struggle of the proletariat against the working class. Um, which I think would express really what you're, what you're getting at. Yes, Carlos. Uh, yeah, uh, in relation to this concept of intersectionality, which is so uh, topical now, nowadays, I, I, I just wanted briefly to comment that, uh, in my view, as this concept tends to equalize and level and flatten uh, all the different struggles and all the different supposedly variables, for example, class, race, etc., and put them in principle at the same level. And I think it's very important. Well, this is related to contemporary neontologies, you know, all tinged with different doses of uh, posthumanism. And this, I think it's very important to challenge that because mm -hmm. we, we, uh, uh, those concepts cannot be equalized. We, uh, we see how prominent racism is nowadays by racism, carries with it classism as well. It's not that, uh, in general, some are more important than others, but class tends to be the prevailing thing. And class might manifest itself in terms of class, in terms of gender, in, in, in very different forms. It depends on the circumstances. So I just wanted to comment about this, to challenge it, and to relate it to these contemporary ontologies, very favorable to the, to the situation, because it boils the the, the, the wheels of capital, whereby one comes to the conclusion that, well, everything is contingent and everything is equalized and humans are not human entities. They interact together and sometimes things go less well than others, but, uh, you know, we carry on. And I think that's, that's a very rationary ideology which presents itself as, you know, uh, well-meaning middle-class ideology, which perhaps is the case, because they are not contradictory, Reactionary ideology and middle class subjectivities, but I think it's important to challenge it. Mm -hmm. So yes. I just yes. wanted to make this point about intersectionality. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Would you like to comment? How can you know, recourse to the working class can it incorporate the, in the not the issue, I mean, you know, the yes, yeah, encompassing and the immigrant issue, let's say, so, you know, because the working class as fed, you know, something that exists, already is fed side, sees the wave, the waves, sorry, skip that, the people crossing borders, the homo suckers, no papers, as the enemy. How can the concept of the working class incorporate the people transcending borders, who the working class, as is being framed now, sees as an enemy? And then the working class is being hijacked by the far left, the far right, the alt right, who constantly tap on this to break and devise the working class as we could. I don't know. Is, is that because of what I said just now about the proletariat against the work? No. no. Or I got lost there, sorry. Which 
Ah, no, I'm not saying you don't have social move. I mean, obviously you have social movements. You have a million types of struggle. You know, some of them may think in terms of anti-capitalism. Most of them probably don't. They may think in terms of opposition to, I don't know, a mining corporation coming in and uh, no other concept, whatever. No, they may be just against the privatization of water. What I'm saying is, really, there is a question of how we conceptualize, I suppose, we, we, who, we who are in the university, right. to how we conceptualize it. And I think that 30, 40 years ago, we tended to think in terms of class struggle. The question then is that there was, okay, there was a reaction against that, and the term social movements sprang up, and everybody now does research or talks about social movements. Great, great that people are studying struggles in a way that wasn't happening before. But my worry is that in the process, the concept of capital as an antagonism, get, as, a, as the central social antagonism gets lost, you know, whereas in the concept of class struggle, you clearly have a notion of a central social antagonism. Uh, yeah? I, speak, yes. Speak well, on the extinction of rebellion, there's some French mind the extinction of rebellion is here, you know, the, the uh, demands are straightforward, three, three demands. Governments tell the truth, um, stop climate emissions by 2025 and set up citizens' assembly and it, with a kind of horizontal organisation, you know, but a bit like the autonomous kind of organisations you talk about. But I said what is fundamental to it is not climate change, but system change. That's capitalism that's doing it. That could be described extinction rebellion as a social movement. But what's unique about it in some way is it, that it's got to the nub of the matter, capitalism, that uh, in a kind of greenwashing we can stop using plastic bottles, we can become vegans, we can stop flying, but these things are really important, but what's most important is the overthrow of capitalism. This is a mass, this is, this is happening as we speak, and I would urge people in this room to think about joining us, really, because the heart of the matter is the overthrow and system change, or what the United Nations are saying, that 11 years before the disaster that you talk about. So that's, so, you know, it could be dismissed as a social movement, but at its heart, it's got uh, an anti-capitalist me message. And that's what's so important about it. It's so important uh, uh, to stop this train towards Armageddon. I think, yeah, I think that's absolutely what I want to say in a way. I don't think I'm disagreeing. I'm saying in these social movements, we have to understand them in the way that you suggest, as movements of resistance and rebellion. That it's the term social movement that kind of flattens that, makes it a bland thing. And so in that sense, I don't disagree. Sorry, there was another. Okay, right. So I carry on. Yeah, no, I'm... Yeah, I want to see what happens at the end as well. It's a kind of a, a suspense story, isn't it? Um, yeah, and this is, we're on to, 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 to question 2.4. And I think for me then is, okay, if we adopt the metaphor of the hydra, does this hydra have a heart? A heartless heart, obviously, but uh, does it have some sort of central point of vulnerability 
is there one um, one thing that is generating um, all this destruction and that could perhaps be changed radically? No. It, the, the answer doesn't have to be yes. I just want it to be yes, I suppose. Um, it seems to me that, yeah, I mean, if again, going back to Marx, Marx in the much neglected first sentence of Capital, because everybody, almost everybody jumps to the second sentence, but in the first sentence, what he says is that human richness exists in the form of the commodity. Okay. In other words, that what we produce or what we create or what we express, um, you know, the way we express our, our becoming, our creativity, this in capitalism gets transformed into a commodity to be bought and sold. Right? And from there, he then goes on to derive so many other aspects of capitalist society. In other words, he says, if our richness exists as commodities, then we relate to one another through our commodities, through the sale and purchase of our commodities. We relate to one another through things. If we relate to one another through the exchange of our products, then it follows that these products must be measured in a way that abstracts from their particularities through and he says this is done through the quantity of socially necessary labor time. If our products are measured through the quantity of socially necessary labor time expended upon them, then this imposes upon human activity the need to perform what he calls abstract labor, labor abstracted from its particularities, a labor that is determined by value and yeah, abstracts from the concrete desires, needs, skills of the person performing the labor. Okay, so we start with this critique of the commodity as the existing form of, of wealth, of richness. We've now got to, this takes us very quickly in the course of what, three, four pages, to what he says is the central critique, which is the critique of abstract labor. In other words, cap Capital, the book Capital, is centrally not just a critique of capital, it is a critique of labor. It is a critique of the forcing of human activity into this daily repeated activity that is measured and paid for and usually meaningless for the person performing it. So, we ha yeah. so Capital, the book, is centrally a critique of labor. If we relate to each other through the exchange of our products, then a single product becomes identified as the medium of exchange, our money and acquires an existence formally autonomous from the interchange of commodities. And the particular existence of money, the existence of money as a particular form, then leads to the possibility and reality of its accumulation 
and transformation into a means of buying the labor power of others as a commodity. In other words, that takes you into a situation of exploitation. It takes you into a situation of class antagonism. No? Um, if we relate to each other through the exchange of our products, then this means that the, it is actually the relation between our products that comes to overtake the relation between people. In other words, the relation between people is, gets converted into a relation between things, okay? what Marx called as commodity fetishism. But if we, this is the last one I want to point out, if we relate to each other through the exchange of our products, then we too become transformed. We become transformed into exchangers or into personifications of our commodities. So we relate to each other not as parts of a social production of human richness, which we obviously are, but as individual owners of commodities fixed in time. So that the existence of the commodity as the dominant form of social relations leads to a process of identification. In other words, Marx is criticizing the commodity, he's criticizing money, he's criticizing abstract labor, and I think he is also criticizing identity. The idea that we are identified, the idea that we become desocialists from being social subjects, parts of a social movement of producing human richness, we become desocialized subjects. From being social doers, creators, we are transformed into desocialized beings. And the notion of being, I think, is the basis of the notion of identity, that we are, we are women, we are men, we are Mexicans, Irish, Scots, homosexuals, whatever. So part of the critique, and it seems to me that this is an element that Marx doesn't actually develop all that much, that is really developed, though not very clearly, but yes, I mean very profoundly, by Adorno, is that the critique of the commodity is a critique of identity. And therefore, and identity is the basis of sexism, racism, um, nationalism. And Adorno, of course, saw Auschwitz as the culmination of the process of identification. So if we're going to talk about how do we relate all these struggles that take identitarian forms, then it seems to me that we have to pass through the critique of identity, and that means a critique of the existence of um, human richness in the form of the commodity. And it follows, of course, that anti-capitalist struggle is therefore anti-commodity, anti-money, anti-labor, anti-identitarian, anti-totality. I'll continue. So the driving force, if we think, oh, I'm, shall I continue? I'm talking a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. 
the driving forces of force of the dynamic of, 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 of capital and is a central antagonism. Traditionally, this central antagonism is understood as the antagonism between capital and labor. But what I suppose I'm suggesting is that underneath that, there is an even more fundamental antagonism, which is the antagonism between human activity and its existence as labor. In other words, in order for capital to, to exploit labor, it must first um, convert human activity into labor, which is the, really the, the struggle of the alarm clock in the morning. I mean, if you're going to, if as a capitalist you're going to exploit workers successfully, you first have to get them to wake up in the morning and go to work and be exploited. This means that okay, this means if we say that capital, the dynamic is the antagonism of capital labor or capital or labor human activity, then we are saying, and it seems to me this is fundamental as well in Marx's argument, but um, perhaps not, not sufficiently stated. It means that capital depends upon labor, just as any ruling class will always depend on the ruled class. You know? Rulers aren't pretty, can't really do very much unless the people they dominate do the work for them. This is this dependence in the case of capital, is very special because it depends not just on their labor, as a feudal lord depends on the labor of his servants, but capital also depends on being able to intensify constantly the subordination of labor. It, in order for capital to maintain its rate of profit, it has to intensify more and more the exploitation of labor, which is, I think, what Marx says in the theory, his theory of the tendency for the race of profit to fall. This, in turn, leads us to the idea that in order for capital to survive, it must periodically restructure the relation of domination okay. um, through a process of crisis. This restructuring, I think, and this is really my, my final group of points, that in order, very often when people talk about crisis, they identify crisis with the restructuring of capital. And you get Schumpeter's idea, for example, of, of crisis as being, what is it, what does he call it, the creative destruction no? of capital. Um, and I think that's wrong completely. I think that crisis, that the restructuring of capital is actually cannot be taken for granted and is extremely <coughs> problematic for capital. So that after, especially after the revolution, restructuring capital means a huge confrontation with labor, with life in general, and it is not easily undertaken. After the Rev Russian Revolution and after the crisis of 1929, <coughs> Capital began to think in terms of how can we postpone this restructuring? How can we prolong the process? How can we make it more gentle? And so you get Keynes, of course, and the um, innovations of, of Roosevelt's New Deal. And in the 1930s, you get Paul Matic um, talking about the permanent crisis of capital. He argued, now we have 
entered into a period of permanent crisis. In fact, as it turned out, he was far too optimistic because capital did resolve its crisis. It did carry through its restructuring through the process of fascism and war and killing, what, 50 million or is it 100 million people? And did actually create a new basis for, um, for its accumulation. I think this is very important because although it created a new basis for, 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 for accumulation, this new basis was also based on a recognition of the importance of social integration and at first the integration of the trade unions. Okay. So that when the need to restructure capital arises again, I mean really the, again the mechanism of postponement comes in. Postponement takes place through the expansion of debt essentially, <coughs> through the creation of fictitious capital. You know, how can we restructure just little by little is the capitalist's problem, how, or the government's problem. How do we do it little by little without having the full frontal accumulation that we need? And we do it little by little by postponing, by expanding debt. And you get this enormous expansion of debt, um, especially after the 1970s, that also has the effect of slowing, and means it expresses itself obviously in the rise in the importance of <coughs> banks, a slowing of growth, um, of productive growth. It makes the whole system much more volatile and eventually it becomes more and more difficult to sustain. This is then expressed in 2008, which had an enormous impact. The financial crisis had an enormous impact, I think, on the whole world in generating anger, causing unemployment, cuts in health service, education, etc., um, the repossession of houses, and a breaking of the political systems of the world of the world, nearly everywhere, a turn against the established parties, the rise of a radical right, of, a anti, of an anti-democratic right. What's worrying is that the crisis of 2008 wasn't really a restructuring at all, because as soon as it became clear what was happening, the <coughs> political leaders panicked and said, no, we can't let that happen, and pumped, what, about $20 trillion into the world economy and maintained then over the next 10 years the politics of quantitative easing, which um, permitted the continued expansion of debt. So that the position now is that debt has really continued on a world level, has continued to expand enormously since 2008. And a lot of economists are saying, well, there's going to be another crash, possibly much, much worse in, 2000, in the next couple of years. So, where does that leave us? Where is the hope in all this? <laughs> That's really the problem, isn't it? I think, um, firstly, if we're going to talk about hope today, it's really, it's a hope against hope. We have to say, yeah. I mean, we, hope is really important, but there's no obvious um, solution. We're not there. It's a hope against hope, or what I sometimes think of as a Janus-faced hope. No, I'm Janus, the god that looks both ways. It's actually a situation that looks towards disaster, unless we can turn it in the other other way towards 
some sort of breaking, fundamental breaking of the, um, of the rule of money, of the rule of capital. I think it may be, I mean, our experience with major crises, I think, is terrible. The crisis of 1929, early 30s, led to fascism, led to war, led to the massacre of millions. The crisis of, 1920, of 2008 has led to Trump, to um, Orban, to Bolsonaro, possibly, to Johnson, um, but has definitely led, led, led. And the real issue for us, and I suppose the issue of hope, is that with a period, of, in a moment of crisis, I think there arises a great social anger. Um, and we really have to say, well, yes, we are part of that anger. You know, that is our anger. How on earth do we bring that anger towards us? How on earth do we bring that anger to us? How do we show not only that the system has failed, that capitalism really doesn't work anymore, but that capitalism doesn't work because it is unable to subordinate us sufficiently. No, it doesn't work because we do not be want, want to be transformed into robots. It doesn't work, finally, because we are the crisis of capitalist domination. And how do we derive from that an understanding of our strength? Um, it seems to me that hope has to, be, has to go in that direction. Um, and that the alternative is really, really frightening. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. facilitate this a little bit more. If we could try and ask questions that are related to the talk, uh, that would be very nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about this age that um, capital is dependent on labor. Because to, to me these days it seems that Capitalism, um, capitalism is dependent on the possession of land, on privatization of ideas, and on, on debt. And I don't see, I don't see what labor is doing. I, I think, in fact, one could say it would be great if it still depends on labor, because then there's at least some hope I can work and like, and I can get a part of the cake, so to say. But I think it's even worse than that. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on, on labor anymore. Can, can we take three questions, yeah. maybe? Um, yes. Um, just, uh, I'm curious about the, if, if you agree that this kind of uh, totalization of capital is reaching the spaces where we are supposed to criticize this, I mean, this space, for instance. And you mentioned a few examples, like uh, these concepts that limit the, the, the radical push that they had before, like a, like a social movement and stuff. And I was thinking that what would happen with other concepts? Like, a, do, you, do you think that a democratic social movement is radical enough to change capitalism? <laughs> or it has to be outside of the, the limits of democratic means more than anything else. Um, so I guess I, I, I really want to be hopeful and I un totally understand the need to have one enemy but I also find that there is sort of like I revisit almost like debates of the 1990s and I sort of have all my feminist friends who are like really? <laughs> are we going back to still one concept that we need to focus on? And yeah. I feel like um, 
Bolsonaro, Trump, etc., are pro like promoting an aggressive masculinity, an aggressive uh, sexism, etc. And I find that understanding them only as representatives of capital and their <coughs> dynamic as only representatives of capital is also um, really disempowering. And I yeah. find that the discourse of like us facing an extinction right now is also. Um, neglecting that historically loads of other groups have been extinct uh, by processes of colonialism and capitalism and that the extinction that we're facing is sort of the, the extinction of the capitalist European uh, system. It's not, it's and by extent the extinction of other systems but that we also need to recognize all the extinctions that have happened before. Okay. Yeah, okay, the first one, no, I don't think you mentioned one of the sources um, of, of, of capital accumulation is the privatization of ideas, but somebody has to, ideas have to be thought by somebody, I mean, they're created by somebody. Um, I don't think so. I think um, we're, because if we're talking about wealth creation, um, I think that does have to be related to human activity. Um, I mean, creation. People, wealth isn't just created out of nothing. Um, I mean, a, you, a particular. Okay, very often the, the, one, one, one idea that has arisen again, criticizing people, David Harvey, I suppose, is the idea of accumulation by dispossession. No, um, I think that doesn't help. I think. I mean, certain, obviously it takes place. I mean, I could become rich by, by um, attracting in one way or another through competition, through my cleverness, through cheating, through stealing, through violence. I can, I as an individual or as an individual enterprise can appropriate wealth created in other places. Um, that happens certainly all the time. I mean, intellectual property and the whole system of patenting, I suppose, is very closely tied in with that. Um, but I don't think we can talk about wealth creation that is not a product of human activity. Um, that's, or we can talk about nature producing wealth in the form of apples or oranges or whatever. But really what interests us most is the question of the organization of human activity. Because it is, it is this organization of human activity that has characteristics that seem to um, be uh, taking us toward, towards disaster. No. On, on this, the second question, um, I've just read, got written down democratic social movement or socialist movement. Um, I think that, uh, and this is really part of my worry, really that in the last 20, 30 years, 
I suppose my argument is that really to avoid disaster, to create a radically different form of society, we have to get rid of capital, which means getting rid of money, which means getting rid of commodity exchange. That is what I mean, I suppose, by revolution. This seems preposterous. It seems so difficult. How on earth can we do it? And I, what I fear is that if we don't do it, then we are really in a dreadful dynamic of destruction. I think because of the disillusion that resulted from the fall of the Soviet Union and China, that what we've seen developing on the left is forms of vocabulary that avoid this issue because it seems simply impossible. So we get the growth, the people start talking about neoliberalism instead of talking about capitalism. They start talking about democracy instead of talking about revolution. Um, they start talking about social movements instead of talking about class struggle or instead of talking of movements of resistance and rebellion. And I think all that is understandable and it can lead to very rich and deep analyses, but that in the process we lose the concept of capital and the need, the desperate need to get rid of capital as the basis of social organization and develop something else. Yeah, no. Maybe I, yeah, I mean, maybe the tone was not that, because I completely agree with you. I, I don't like democracy so much. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the, my, my fear is exactly that, that every democratic achievement that we have, that it looks like it is an amazing thing, they just cut in another head of the hydra. Yeah, that, that's exactly it, yeah. Um, then if, if, you, if we keep going on these democratic constraints of, of pushing something, we are just getting to the head, but never to the heart. Yes. And then the, the, the question becomes really awful because it looks like a, it is violent revolution all the time because democracy is violent. That's right. On, the, on the, the last question, which I think is very important, I mean, in a way, I suppose I, that's what I'm trying to grapple with. Um, I'm very conscious, I suppose, we're all very conscious of the huge upsurge of um, feminist and women's struggles in recent years, for example, um, talking to a friend about a week ago who'd just come back from Argentina and Uruguay, she's talking about the, the feminist rebellion or revolution that's taking place there. Enormously important struggles. Um, what I want to say, it comes back as well to what Carlos was saying about intersectionality. I think my worry is that if we talk about a coexist, as very often people do talk of a coexistence of patriarchy and of capitalism and of um, very often colonialism is thrown in as well. I suppose something, there's something about me that wants to say, yes, but we have to understand their origin, and we have to understand their origin in terms of the creation of identities, no? I mean, to talk about women is to already create an identity, no? Or to talk about blacks or, of course, indigenous struggles, which are so important in Latin America at the moment. If you talk about them, as identities, then I feel that you're actually feeding in 
to a system that is based on identification. That is why I have the need, I suppose I feel the need to go back and say, but it is the way in which we relate to one another through money, through, um, through the exchange of commodities, that is what produces identities. That is what produces the grammar of we are rather than, or I am rather than we do. Um, that, that, that's really, I suppose, my, um, where I want to push to or where I want to develop, but that I still find very difficult. I do see it um, in, I mean, you've got it to some extent in Caliban and um, in Silvia Federici's Caliban and the, what's it called, and the witch, no? where you've got the idea of um, this whole process of the origin of, of, of capitalism redefining women, no? And redefining the separation between women and men. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, I suppose that's where I am, um, no, which is not at all to deny the importance of feminist theory, but I do think it has to, somehow we have to go back to that fundamental question of identity and identification and being anti-identitarian. No? Are you okay to carry on? Hmm? Are you okay to carry on? I'm fine. Another three? Yeah. Um, there's been a kind of big growth in chartalist approaches to economics, like the modern monetary theorists in the last few years. And they're Sorry, I, the modern monetary theorists in economics mm. nowadays are really pushing this idea of money as a creation of the state that should be wielded for our benefit. Do you see any hope in that as a kind of revelation of money as our thing, as opposed to that of its holders? Yeah. We'll take three, no? Mm -hmm. so it looks like we're ignoring these ones, but I hate directly behind you. Uh, yeah, I guess... Um, Two quick things, I'll try to be quick. One, because uh, it's good to point out it's a challenging thing uh, that needs to eliminate money or, or something like that. Um, so one is uh, about... Uh, just to, what you think about, I think a big problem is internationalization. I mean, so, someone was talking about, I mean, labor being less important. I mean, every people talk about robots all the time, but things are made by people. It's just there's you, you're disconnected from them in a way that that I don't think any of the theorists we're talking about would realize. It's all, a lot about supply chains and things like that. It's also you know, I mean, uh, I don't. I think I agree with you that it. You know, trees and the rainforests, which are essential for for you know life, aren't going to be ever be truly safe unless you have big systemic change. But you know, you can't eliminate money before you deal with the problem of well, Bolsonaro is in power in Brazil. We don't have an international way of stopping deforestation there. That's kind of a local problem, really. Uh, I mean, there's people working on it internationally, but it's, it's really a national. Issue. I mean, it, that just needs to happen. Uh, uh, and the last, the, so the, the point, the question is about the international issue and all of these, and how that, that's changed. The other one is about state part of power. So modern monetary theory is a great question. I mean, all of these multinational companies, they're not, you know, relying on a ghost of capital or something like that. They, they rely on state power, you know, whether it's vulture funds relying on the courts in New York, to get money out of uh, developing nations, whether it's debt it, uh, extraction, whether it's the subsidy of any industry from the financial industry to the petroleum industry to, uh, you know, a a anything rely or private equity, any anything like that, it just relies on state power. So state power, I agree with you that, you know, none of us are safe unless there's systemic change, but, you know, there's remedies available that could, could, 
could change a lot of people's lives. So I, I don't think you should have a lack of imagination, but I, I think you articulated it in the last point. But uh, do, do you think you're demeaning some of the quick wins a, a bit by focusing on kind of the, the big issue, or do you think it's, it's, it's compatible with the kind of bigger question? <clears throat> Thanks very much, John. Um, uh, I, I'm not deep, I'm not, I can't claim to be well researched or well read in many of the things you're talking about, but they're certainly very challenging rather than annoying. And um, I, I, I mean, to a large extent, insofar as I understand them, I kind of understand you and I gladly agree with you. But I'm a human geographer and I tend to think very much about particular contexts I'm engaged with critically. In my case, those are Scotland, to some extent other parts of the United Kingdom, the United States, and Poland, which I've interacted with since the late 70s. And so it's useful, I, I, and I tend to think of how these places are different in terms of the interaction of politics, culture, history, economy, religion. Okay? And th these differences, I think, are significant. Maybe I exaggerate them. So it's useful to have you stating very general processes that maybe I kind of tend to, to downplay. But if I'm looking for hope, you're looking for hope, John. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've taken a little bit of hope from the way Ireland's changed in recent years. The two, the referen the two referenda, which were surprising. In, in the results, and clearly I Ireland is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, kind of moving on a path to be a, a more modern, open, inclusive society. Now, also I think in the Scottish context, during the independence referendum in 2014, um, I was, you know, somebody who was brought up in the 50s and 60s in the west of Scotland, who had grew up with a somewhat negative view of my own country. I was really surprised favorably about so many things I saw happening. We had about at least 300 groups springing up spontaneously. And these are social movements happening largely spontaneously, campaigning for Scottish independence. We had the biggest group, Women for Independence and Independence for Women. Very active, still a very active group. We had lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transsexuals for independence. We had Nigerians for Scottish independence. We had Poles, Bram, an organised group for Scottish independence. Uh, we had um, South, we had Sc Scottish Asians for independence. We had English Scots for independence. We even had Rangers and Celtic supporters <laughs> <laughs> for independence. I'm not sure how many of them had managed to get together on that. <laughs> Now, what brought all these groups? I mean, this went on, the campaigning, debating, mostly pretty civilised, with a few exceptions, arguing about everything to do with Scottish um, society, politics, culture, the, na the National Health Service, the interaction of the welfare state in Scotland, and the economy, and all kinds of things. Everything was on, up for debate, and it was happening all over the place at a grassroots level. And I was amazed at this. You know, I could... I, it was... Um, I was amazed at how civilised it was. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, uh, what, um, what brought these groups together was certainly leftish ideas. They all want mainly a, a more inclusive Scotland, and we could see it happening before our eyes. You know, all these you know, very diverse groups. The, the, the No campaign had very little to offer on the other side. Okay? Well, well, sorry, right, I'm now, sure. okay. Please, so. Please try and well, I'm, Hamish, I'm trying to bring it to a particular context in Scotland. I hope so you I think, think that's relevant. Now, um, that okay, now, um, so this is, uh, I think this is, uh, okay, now, if Scotland, and the, the hope, of course, was that Scotland became independent, it would be in a better position to resist or loosen or detach itself from the hegemonic structures of power politics that are centred in London. And I, I don't know much about Antonio Gramsci, but I need to know more on that concept of hegemony, cultural, political, and economic. Now, um, okay, now Scotland did become independent, um, 
I mean, I think there's a good chance that some of that would happen, but we still have a very unequal society, probably still class-ridden and so on. But um, you were asking for sources of hope. So I, would you accept that uh, in the Scottish context one could find some hope? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, okay, the first question was about modern monetary theory, isn't that right? Or, yeah? Um, I don't really know about enough about modern monetary theory. Um, it seems to me, though, that um, I don't know, the, the, the big uh, policy debates, I think, over, I suppose for a very long time, but I think certainly over recent years, and I think will probably become much more intense in the years to come, is the whole question of, yes, of debt expansion and the relation to states and the degree to which states intervene to loosen uh, or tighten the expansion of money, which is um, really a question of how you manage or try to manage um, crisis. Now, obviously, they're doing that all the time, and that's what the central banks do. You know? But um, there is certainly, in many of the things I read, the feeling that this is um, getting out of control in the sense that there is the constant um, build-up of debt that is likely to lead to another serious um, explosion within a couple of years. Um, I'm not an economist, I may be wrong, but it does seem to me that that makes sense. It's, it can be approached, um, I mean not now, but I think one, one, one important way for, for me would be um, in terms of fictitious capital, you know, um, there's really capital, the reproduction of capitalism over the last 30, 40 years has been more and more based on the expansion of, of, of fictitious capital and just what that means and what the, the, the dangers and possibilities inherent in that are. I, that seems to me a very major and important question. Okay. On the other second question, which I've got, um, you were saying, well, how do we eliminate money, partly? It was a question about international, so I went on and on, but it was about international, the, the yeah. problem of internationalization and, and the separation, you know, we're still based on nation states, basically, within our own Well. I think in terms of in internationalization, I suppose I, my view is that capital is inherently global um, and always has been, in fact, and that it just moves very fast to wherever it can, 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 can um, maximize its profit. Um, so it's not movement out from nations, though it's often seen in that term. It's really movement at a global level um, that... that, that um, penetrates the whole world. One thing you did raise, or one thing that set off, you set off in my mind, which is not quite the same, um, is the question of, well, how on earth do we, do we say, oh, we're going to abolish money? It sounds so ridiculous. It sounds so ridiculous unless we say, well, maybe we should think of it not just we abolish money, that would be great, but that the real challenge is decommodification. Now, if we think of decommodification and we look back to the last century, in a sense, decommodification was at the center of all the political struggles, certainly in the first half of the century. Um, Russia, the whole Russian Revolution, is about the decommodification, at least in the immediate sense of so many activities. But the struggle during after the war here was for decommodification. And that the whole question of the decommodification of health provision is absolutely crucial, I think. That went wrong. I think that went wrong 
I would say partly because it was conceived of in terms of state intervention rather than in terms of a more radical decommodification. Um, yeah, and partly because the, the decommodification was always subject to the domination of money and therefore commodification. But if we were to rephrase this idea of abolish money in terms of decommodification, then perhaps it, it's much easier to see it um, in terms of a political force. I don't know. It was, yeah. And the third one, Bob's, about Ireland and Scotland and all that's happening and all the signs of good things, I mean. And yet, and isn't this hope? I think, he, I mean, yes, great, great things have been happening. No, but I think within, they take place within the context of an accelerating destruction, social destruction. I think that's, you know, and yeah, there is the constant struggle all the time. But if we forget that context, if we forget the overarching structural forces, then I think um, we are only seeing a part of what is going on. You know? Um, for example, um, in a book called Crack Capitalism, I argued and still argue that the only way we can really think of revolution is in terms of cracking the social texture, texture of capital. That is, in terms of creating spaces um, not dominated by capital, creating spaces in which we create other ways of relating. And you can see that's happening all over the place. I mean, in very big scale, um, if I think of the Zapatistas, if I think of the Kurdish movement in Rojava, but I think also on a very small scale too, in terms of groups of people going out to really trying to lead their lives in different ways. Um, we had the film of the SAD movement in France um, at the workshop on Friday. And there are lots and lots of examples of that. I think what I'm trying to, and that is really the substance of hope. Okay, fine. What I'm trying to say now, I think, is yes, but it's not enough. It's not enough unless in some way those movements actually shake the structure of domination. No, that is, and that is really what I'm worried about or trying to think about. Okay, um, that's why in the announcement um, for, the, for the, the, the thing today, I have something about the, I liked that, I thought it was very good, <laughs> the dialectical chime of doom, of, of not enough, not enough. And I do think that um, really in some way, after talking about these struggles that emotion, you know, really enthuse us, you know, whether the Zapatistas, whether Rojava, whether the Irish and the abortion thing, whether Scottish Rangers against for independence or whatever. And Celtic. And Celtic, of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> no? That um, somehow we have to add, say, yes, fantastic, and not enough, not enough. No. Um, and we can even think of that in terms of time and the time that people spend doing things. I mean, here we are, okay, fine, we're in a, even within the university, we probably have a sense of being a minority, that lots of most university activity is actually directed towards strengthening the rule of capital. If we go beyond the university, yes, people do exciting things. They sell socialist worker on Saturdays or 
whatever. But during the week, they are constructing, um, perhaps constructing, um, the system that is destroying us. So I think sometimes we focus on these great things and we forget to see, yes, but really most people spend most of their time creating a system that is destroying us. Now, how do we break that? How do we take up this not enough, not enough, and think it through? That's okay. I'm sure I've been talking for too long. Far hours. too long. <laughs> and, and, and we, and we need well, we only have the room till five, so I'm afraid I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there if that's okay. Um, I'm sure. Well, I don't want to presume, but he'll probably be around for a few more minutes if you want to ask him questions one on one. But I think if we could just give him a round of applause. And thank you very much, Hamish. Thank you all. For me, it's a real delight to be back here. It's, you know. Come again. Yes. <laughs>